Thank you all for being here. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Let's, uh, let's get into it. Jason, I want to start with you. Where did this really start? You know, you deciding to go for it and just approach something as big as writing a book. Um, well, I wanted to be at the Strand talking to all of you fine people. <laughs> so I said, how can I make that happen? No, um, so a couple... I'm going to do the same thing, don't worry. <laughs> A couple of <laughs> years ago, um, I wrote an article for Kotaku, which is a video game website that covers snacks and TV shows. And <laughs> we, uh, I wrote an article about the video game Destiny and how it turned out the way that it did, which is uh, not the best. Um, <laughs> and so that game, that game had some story issues, I guess I would say, to the, say the least. And I uh, did kind of an investigative piece as to what went wrong there. And after we published that piece, I got an email from my now agent, Charlie Olson, and he basically said, it was like a one-line email, I remember him saying, uh, the book? I was like, <laughs> we should turn this into a book, something like that, I remember the exact wording. Um, and basically, he and I started talking and the idea started formulating that I should do a book that is a collection of stories like that that aren't told very often and um, the video game industry is is secretive um, it's that's your fault <laughs> um, the video game industry likes to keep their secrets and so uh, I thought it would be really interesting to uh, dig into some stories and get some people to talk that wouldn't normally talk and uh, yeah it was is that's it kind of we, we put together a book proposal and we pitched it to my now editor Eric Myers who's here and uh, he loved the idea, and we just we made it happen. It was actually surprisingly quick, considering how slowly book publishing usually <laughs> moves. Um, that we made it happen within just two years. But yeah, and now it's out. Workflow-wise, I'm curious because you know you pump out stuff every day mm -hmm. at your day job. H how did you balance writing a book and going around and talking to people while also still fulfilling your regular obligations? Well, I didn't sleep, okay. and that helped. Um, a lot of nights and weekends dedicated to this thing. Um, yeah, I, I took off a little bit of time from Kotaku, but it was mostly nights, weekends, um, not seeing my fiance for a while. And um, it was, yeah, I mean, it was just, just the way that I structured it because I put it together as uh, 10 different stories and each chapter of the book is a different story. I kind of, I saw it as 10 mega Kotaku articles, which helped me break it up a little bit. So like I, I wrote them each one at a time over the course of about a year and a half and did the reporting for them uh, one at a time. So it, it was helpful to be able to segment them that way. It, it was good too that it was able to be published fairly quickly because all the stuff is pretty relevant and up to date. Like, you know, you're reading stories about Destiny, you're reading stuff about a canceled Star Wars game. Like, that's still pretty recent stuff, so. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I wanted to do was do modern games because uh, there are a lot of books about older games and I don't think there's a lot of material out there that, that digs into, like, how are games made in the 21st century and what is that process like? And that's one of the goals that I had there. Th that was definitely the theme. That was, did you see my notes? It, it, the whole book is focused around uh, just how insane it is for a game to even be made. I've seen a lot of people saying that, and that's just the whole point. It, uh, people say it's a miracle that games are made. So what really does that mean, especially for you guys who have been in the trenches? What does that mean? Like, is it that big of a task? No, I, I think that um, spot on. First of all, thank you for writing the book because I 100% agree that these stories aren't told enough and that there's there's definitely layers of secrecy for a variety of reasons in the industry. Um, and so thank you for shining some light on that. And, and, and for us, you know, reading it, having just shipped a game, you know, Every chapter was like, oh, yeah, I know that. I was so triggered reading this book. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, God, crunch, oh, God. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't remember who the quote was from about it's a miracle that any game ships. And that, that is true. Like, I think every day you come in and there's some insurmountable challenge. And you're like, there's no way. We just shut it down right now. We're not getting over this hurdle. Um, and somehow, you know, you come together, you, you start to play. Like, if you looked at the number of tasks and the enormity of, of, of challenge when you start to, 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 to build a game, you have to be crazy to do it. You have to be crazy to go through with uh, the, the whole process, but somehow you just break it all down. You have producers who are able to, to, to list everything down into bite-sizable uh, chunks and, and you know, just nail it down one by one, you know, just 
fight your way through it. Um, but absolutely, it's a yeah, miracle. Yeah, I think that one of the things that um, I've learned over the years is that when we all play games and we love games, games are really cool, games do really interesting things and they make us feel in a lot of ways that other media can't. But when we play them, I think there's a lot we're not seeing or not realizing that game developers know about but that we don't. For example, when you play a game like, just off the top of my head, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, which is this astounding achievement. It's this giant, massive open world that you could play for hundreds of hours and not see everything. The things that we don't think about are really important. Like, for example, every single time you see a rock in the world and you pick it up and there's a Korok seed under it that you can find, someone put that there. Someone's hard work went into making that happen. Or, like, every time you swing a sword, not only did someone have to animate the swing of your sword, they had to catch any bugs that might have happened when you swing swung the sword at the same time as something else was happening 100 feet away that might have interfered with the sword swing and made your sword start flying in the air. Um, and one of the things that I think that I didn't realize until I really started digging deep and reporting on this stuff is how many factors go into all of this. Um, there's so many things happening behind the scenes when we're playing these games from uh, physics systems to like the way that each gameplay mechanic work, the way that your uh, uh, buttons translate to actions on the screen and all of that can fall apart really easily a lot of things that I've heard are of a lot of stories that I've heard are of games just totally falling apart because someone pressed the wrong thing or entered the wrong line of code a, a, a lot of times you, you ship a game and it's held together it's a house of cards a lot of times it's the slightest little change you find things that you would like to change but it's like well if we change that it becomes you know a domino effect where everything starts to, to fall right and so uh, you, that, that's why you know you, you become so intimate with your engine and your team and you, you understand exactly what makes it tick and sometimes you get the feedback and it's like well it would be much better if you did it this and you're like no, we talked about that. We can't do that because of X, Y, and Z, and, and you just want to tear your hair out, right? Our, our, uh, uh, one of our team members says, don't shake the jello. And towards the end of the game, Bill was adding these little things. I'm like, you're shaking the jello. Don't shake the jello. And yeah. Jello <laughs> shake. <laughs> A lot, a lot of this stuff is wrapped up in what is being called crunch, crunch time, uh, you know, where long hours and late nights kind of lead up to the completion of the game. Is it really as bad as they say it is? Because it was highlighted it's in worse. your book a lot. <laughs> it's worse? How worse? Well, I, listen, every, every company is different. And I think that there are a lot of lessons that we could do better as an industry in terms of, uh, of sharing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but you know, the reality is that, you know, you're talking about a hugely creative endeavor when you mix technology, as, as you point out in the book, you mix technology that is always shifting with uh, subjective pieces of things like fun. Uh, I mean, the example I like to use is if, you, if you're talking about building a house, right? You get a, you get a contractor, you get an architect, you get all these people together, and are they on time? No, I mean, no, no, no contractor is ever on time, right? They're always late, and they put in some serious long hours, right? Now, if you add to that fact that you have subjective elements of like, the house needs to be fun when you go into it, <laughs> and then you add into the fact that not only that, you have to invent every single tool that they're going to use to build that house. Oh, and on top of that, create the entire world of physics so that <laughs> when you, you swing that hammer, things need to react in a, a, a realistic way. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's no doubt that you're going to face some, some questions and no, no amount of planning is ever going to make that foolproof. Some teams have done, as I understand it, the, the, and I don't want to speak for them, but the Dishonored team has done really well in terms of planning and, and they're a, a relatively uh, veteran and seasoned team, so they've avoided a lot of it. Um, I think that to me, I don't purposely say, yep, we're going to crunch, but I, I do everything we, can, we do everything we can to plan for it. But we know that you know it's it's there looming, and that oftentimes is a motivation to to put in some extra hours early on, so it doesn't you know alleviate some of the the pain at the end. The uh, the other oh go ahead. The other thing about the house is that uh, once you finish it, someone discovers like a little piece of paint chipping, and then they go on Reddit and call you lazy. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. Yep. Um, and I think crunch looks different for different places. You know, it, when, when Bill was at Irrational crunching on Bioshock, you know, he would leave in the morning at 10 and get home at 2 a.m. and I became a World of Warcraft addict because yeah. he was gone so much. Um, whereas on Perception, our crunch was we have two infants who keep us up all night, 
So we work all day. We work in the middle of the night. Both of us got mono. We were coding at the computer with pillows propping us up and uh, just family keeping us alive. And um, so I really think that uh, crunch is different for different places. But our crunch, like we could not have expected for us to both fall ill with something debilitatingly <laughs> sickening. You know, we couldn't have foreseen a lot of the things that happened. So, yeah, you can plan all you want, but nobody plans mono. <laughs> nobody plans, you know. I, I, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, so I think one of the keys here is um, knowing that that monster is looming uh, in the background. Uh, but, you know, again, you want to really plan for it, but I think it's also really important to have structures in place that will support you. In our case, that was our family. My mother and, and uh, two, two of our boys are here. Uh, but, you know, people to help you out in development when you need it. Uh, and, and when I was crunching at Irrational, I think all of us were doing it voluntarily because we believed in what we were building. And that drive, because we could, we, could, we could sense that something special right around the corner, and so that, that drove us into work every, every, every day and kept us there late hours. Um, I imagine that on some projects, that's quite a bit more difficult. So what I was going to say is that that is actually the most insidious type of crunch, because uh, something that I've found talking to a lot of people who make games, uh, especially in the big budget world of AAA games, the Call of Duties and Destinies of the world, is that um, a lot of people are just voluntarily putting in extra hours because they know if they don't stay until midnight one night, that feature that they really love is not going to make it in the game or those bugs won't be fixed. And what happens is you contribute to this culture where other people around you, they don't want to be like the jerk who's leaving at 7 p.m. when you're staying at, until midnight. Yep. So everyone feels like they have to be staying late. And when this happens for like a week, okay, it's fine. It can be thrilling even if you do it for a week or a weekend or something like that. But when it happens for months, months on end, which is what happens in the video game industry, that's when it becomes really toxic and a systemic problem. And I think that uh, a lot of game developers would like to find ways to fix this, but it's so difficult. I mean, how do you how do you stop a culture where everyone feels like they have to work as hard as possible just to get something out the door? Well, also, you know, we're creative types and we bleed for our work. And a lot of times it's not that you want to put in the hours, but like if you want it, you're right, like you said, like to get that feature in, you know, you just, you, you bleed more for it. And you know, one of my favorite authors, Chuck Wendig says, art harder. You know, like when you're a writer or you're a creative type, you art harder, like you go hard on that and you, you get it done because you're a creative type and you want your vision to look the way you want your vision to look. But there is that ripple effect. I, I even run into that just because like making videos, I live for if I have a long weekend in front of me and I'm like, oh, okay, I'll have a day off, so that means I could do three days worth of work in one day just to make up for it, and I love it. But how does that become, how, how does it start to become institutionalized? Does it? I've seen some examples where it, culture becomes part of the, like, pen and paper of the development process. How, how does that, that happen? That, I think, is, is the, and you, you address this as well, I think that's the real danger here, is you want to make sure, I mean, every, every company is going to be different, every culture is going to be different, and I think it's up to, um, until there's some sort of unionization, which I'm not necessarily in favor of, I think it's up to the companies to, to sort of understand and dictate, but also support their team enough that if, if they're going to crunch it, they have support mechanisms in place where that's tolerable, number one. Mm -hmm. But I think also that, you know, I, I think companies should let the cultures drive themselves to a degree, and I think a lot of that comes from the passion. You're absolutely right that, you know, there's a little bit of pressure, and I think that uh, you know, just driven internally by in some companies. One quick aside on that note, actually, um, my understanding, and this is just from Folks, uh, it, it, you know, I've, I've known in various companies, or whatever. Um, but Call of Duty, zombie mode. As I understand it, that was a little pet project. At um, I can't think of the name of the the, the, the company. I think it was uh, Treyarch at the time. Yes, yeah, so, sorry, yes, Treyarch. Yeah. Top of my head. Uh, so Treyarch, there were I don't know, it was like three to four or five people who were uh, had this idea for the zombie mode. You're boarding up this this you're sort of hunkering down and trying to defend against zombies or whatever. And so they pitched it to the higher ups and they weren't buying it. It was like, we don't have the time, we don't have the schedule. And so they just came in one weekend and prototyped it and put it in. And they started to win people over and show people the prototype. And like, it became the kind of thing where it was this swell of like, we need to make this happen. And so we put in the, the, the time and look what that's become now, right? Look, look at what the, yeah, the, now we'll So look. that to me is a, is a healthy crunch. But you know, if it's the kind of thing where you're a cog on the wheel and you have to do it because everyone else is and you know, you've got a family at home, that's unhealthy. And that, I, I think that... Again, that's where I think that, I don't know if that's uh, 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 an infrastructural thing with the industry or if that's uh, per company, uh, that's, that's difficult uh, because I know that a lot of magic happens because of crunch. 
Have any of you heard of any other extreme examples? Like in the book, I believe it was a Naughty Dog lead that got another apartment. He rented another apartment closer mm -hmm. to the studio so he wouldn't kill himself while falling asleep driving every night. Have you heard of any other crazy stories like that? Oh, yeah. I mean, there are people who have, like, <laughs> this is, we're getting into super depressing territory here. Just Let's do it. Yeah. But, I, yeah, there are people who have ruined their relationships, who have gotten divorces because of crunch. I've heard of people who have gone to the hospital, had serious illnesses as a result of crunch. I've heard of people who have had mental breakdowns. Um, I heard a story once from a AAA game developer who like was had crunched so hard that uh, he like totally forgot a portion of working on a game and like he tried to remember this this portion of his life and it was just totally blanked out because he had worked so much that it just like like was erased from his memory um, yeah it's it's a very uh, and and I hope this book leads to more conversations and I hope people are having more conversations about this and about finding ways to uh, make games in healthier ways. Yeah, uh, to wrap up crunching, how do we steer away from it? Like, what do producers do or upper management? How, how does this change? Can it change? That's really, I think, the bigger question because there is creativity in there. Well, so the problem is that uh, big game publishers that like money, um, they have ideas of what should be doable within a certain n num uh, number of months, number of years. So they might say, you guys have to make this game within two years. And the people who are making that game might know that like, they only get a bonus if they hit an 85 on Metacritic. And they, if, if they don't sell enough copies, their studio will shut down. So they have to put in those extra hours to make the game good with in that limited time frame of two years that they have. So really the problems are deeply rooted and start way at the top and it has to, the, the video game industry has to get to a point where the people on top are no longer asking for game developers to do things in unreasonable amounts of time. And at that point maybe the, the conversation can start to shift. But that, I don't know, it feels like something catastrophic has to happen to trigger that because multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar companies don't like to change unless they have to, um, especially when they're still, when they're making plenty of money off of these things. So that's uh, uh, the depressing reality, at least from my point of view. No, I think absolutely. Uh, you touched on a lot of important pieces there, and I think that it's, this sort of discussion is, is somewhat cyclical, um, and I think it's reemerged recently, partly because the industry has shifted towards like, and I think it's shifting again, but the past few years it's shifted towards really, really ginormous projects, right? Like, uh, yeah, it's like quadruple A, right? <laughs> it's these giant projects, and then you have a ton of really small projects that have emerged because of the indie scene and all that sort of stuff. So slowly, you've had two sides to crunch emerge. One is I'm a cog in a wheel at a giant corporation and I'm being pressured and I have to do this or I'm gonna lose my job or the game's gonna fail and it, uh, we're all screwed. Um, there's that, or there's the, we're a scrappy bunch and we got to get this thing done, and we're proud of it, and we're doing it voluntarily, and, uh, and, and look, we're having a good time doing it. Uh, maybe not necessarily a good time, but we're doing it voluntarily. Um, and so you have those two sides to the same coin, and I think now that uh, you're seeing the industry, the last generation, the middle uh, budget-sized games disappeared completely. They're starting to reemerge now, that you have the indie scene starting to grow quite a bit more, and you're seeing more money get put behind the indie scene. Um, and so I think you'll start to see that conversation change a little bit now that you have that sort of middle ground again. But anyway, my two cents were, were was that just that there were, uh, that changed quite a bit and that's why it came up again is because you had more people and these giant, you know, machines being like chewed up and spit out. Um, and then you had the voluntary crunch as well. <laughs> Moving on to something a little more positive. Uh, there's a chapter in the book focusing around the development of Stardew Valley, which was one dude, uh, Eric Barone. And I thought it was really endearing, really charming, just the fact that it was just him and it was his girlfriend at the time just supporting him. She was working two jobs and he was just at his computer every day. And I, I really think that it, it's, it's really, sorry, I blanked for a second. The, it, it gets so intense, really. The question is, do you have examples of uh, other things like that where it's just a little support system and for, for you guys, how do you guys support each other when things kind of heat up in the middle of a project? Well, I mean, we are a very unique example. You know, we're a married couple who made Perception in our basement with four children. Um, and they didn't work on the game. They were just <laughs> they, they, they just lived there. 
<laughs> Next Try year, to. right, guys? Um, so for us, and you know, there really was no separation between work and family life. We would be at their soccer games, you know, with our you know laptop and like taking notes on a scene. We would be out at dinner, like, "Hey, we're on a date." Like, no, we're not on a date. We're talking about like a haunting, spooky thing. Um, but <laughs> for us to sort of give each other that sort of space when we needed it. Like, I'm big into yoga now because I needed to chill out because crunch and four kids makes you a little crazy. And, you know, there were times where, like, we got, you got a bike and, you know, you went out and, uh, and went out on the bike with the kids. And so you sort of just need to, like, be able to read each other. <laughs> and if it's, your, if it's your coworkers, yeah, if it's your, your family, yeah, I think um, we definitely supported each other when we both got sick, though, during crunch. Okay. That was pretty it, horrible. It, honestly, <laughs> in most, most of the time, it's the, the little things. Um, so, you know, when things were really bad, uh, you know, my mother would bring me, you know, coffee in the morning. And uh, uh, Amanda, I'd come home. We would, we would like, our schedules are, were sort of flip-flopped where, you know, I'd be going to bed at 3 in the morning and she'd be getting up at 4 with the kid babies or whatever. So we'd kind of, like, you know, tag, tag each other out and that kind of thing. And so, um, so we're on different schedules. But, you know, a bunch of times for, you know, a month or so, every randomly there'd be a, a little card, you know, a little Hallmark card on my desk just talking about how proud she was and all this. And, and you know, there's a lot that you have to do to make a game from home work, but the the things that really push you, I feel, are the little things. Um, uh, you know, the, the things that kind of make all the difference. How about when I think we all kind of face this, whether whatever it is we make, uh, sort of a disconnect sometimes between the people that play the games and the people that make them or work within them or write about them or whatever. How do you guys feel about that in terms of? I guess drive and just work. Like, what do you do when sometimes you do feel, I know I personally, sometimes I, I get kind of down when I see so many people pooping on games when all I want to do is just kind of talk about them and have fun. Well, I mean, there, in fairness, there is a lot to poop on. There is a lot that's <laughs> worth pooping. Um, well, I, I think that, I mean, at least from my perspective, just as a reporter, I think it's really important to educate people and to inform people and keep people just apprised of how games are made and why they're so expensive to make and why so much uh, blood, sweat, and pixels goes into <laughs> making them. Um, and uh, uh, I think that... that an educated gamer is a gamer that's less prone to um, get really angry and then take out their angry on the wrong target. And I think that uh, some of the reactions that I've gotten to this book actually is a lot of people coming up to me and saying like, hey, I'm gonna be a little bit uh, less hasty, less quick to jump on Twitter and call someone a jerk because they made a game that I didn't like or because their game is full of microtransactions because I know that it wasn't their fault. Um, I think the more that we educate people about uh, how this process works, the more, the less hostility there will be, but there's definitely a problem of, uh, a serious problem of toxicity in the video game world and video game communities, and uh, uh, we've seen a lot of that spring up in, in many ways for many reasons, and there uh, are uh, a, a lot of things to deal with there. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's, I mean, that's why I love PAX. That's why I love stuff like this. That's why I love uh, getting a chance to talk to, to gamers and get a sense for like, you know, I need to know what, what people are looking for in their games and they need to know what goes into making it. You know, not everyone has to understand every, the, the, I remember a while back there was that whole, um, uh, I can't remember what it was, the, the, the Frustrum rendering thing or whatever, but there was this whole thread online about how someone was, had a snarky comment about, you don't know what Frustrum, or, or, I don't even know what the term was or whatever. Frustrum calling. Frustrum calling. Thank you, yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah, Why yeah, do yeah. I know that? I uh, know. Which is to say that you know, basically you'll render the world, you'll only render parts of the world that are within your Frustrum of what you can see. So the things behind me right now are not rendering. And so there was a little bit of snark. Which is kind of crazy to think about. Like when you're in a game, all that's on the screen is what you're looking at. If like you could zoom the camera out, you would just see like nothingness surrounding you, which is kind <laughs> of interesting amazing. to think about. Right. Um, so you, not everyone needs to know that, but I think what's great about the book, again, is that it gives you know, a, a, a real nice window into the emotional state and the sort of inner workings and uh, you know, a lot of the deal making and a lot of the, 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 the heart heartache and all that sort of stuff that goes in that are be they're out of your hands right uh, you're talking about halo wars and you're talking about how you know ensemble they come microsoft comes in and says you know we've got to finish the game and we're closing you down you know that's that's heartbreaking uh but i think it's also kind of triumphant because the team kept coming in and they finished the game um but anyway uh so i think 
just to go back to PAX real quick, just I think it's important to keep the door open and to keep cha the communication open because honestly, if you find a dev that you like, ask them a question. Just say, hey, how does this work? You know, mo more, more often than not, they're going to want to chew your ear off and tell you how it does work because they're proud of it. And I think that the, the industry is a better place when people are just talking. And you know this book and PAX and Twitter and all this sort of stuff. Take those opportunities to to try and learn, and we I think it will just help make the industry better. It's invigorating. I mean, for me, the first time I spoke to someone who made a game with their hands as a real person, it changed the way I approached any sort of feelings I had about a game, negative feelings. Uh, but that does lead to feedback. Uh, there's a chapter about Diablo 3 with the big expansion, which was built almost entirely just from what fans had problems with with the initial vanilla Diablo. So feedback seems huge. How do you guys go about gathering it and how, how often do you gather it during the process? And uh, do you have any other examples even of uh, people really making good off of that? So um, that chapter really resonated with us because um, so Perception came out in May and June uh, on PC, Xbox One, and PS4. And when it came out, we weren't done. We decided to take so much of the feedback that we received and do a remaster. And the remaster turned into the Switch version. And the Switch version is going to be out soon. And so we took all of the feedback from reviews and gamers. We watched people do Let's Plays. Like We, we picked apart how other people were playing our game. And this was stuff that we did not see happen in our playtesting sessions really? and in our QA sessions. So we actually streamlined the story. We changed the ending. We added two new modes. Wow. Like We actually we're stoked about doing this remaster because it we listened to what people were saying they're like you know what i really love this game but like i get scared e easily i don't want to play it anymore we put in a narrative mode for people who love walking sims and a lot of people were like this isn't scary enough and we were like well ha we'll put in a scary mode um so it was actually really kind of invigorating to take that feedback and turn it into something good and productive rather than just sit there and stew um so did you want to talk more about the remaster well, process? Well, yeah, so uh, for about two years, I ran the um, uh, user testing department at Irrational. Uh, you know, as we started to, to, to wrap up on, on Bioshock Infinite, we realized that we had, you know, all of a sudden you had UX emerging in the industry, right? And, and people were starting to, to actually formalize how you take feedback, right? Up until that point, it was all like, hey, someone on a forum is saying something. Maybe we should, <laughs> it was just like, I think one of the problems that you have is, you know, you have to, very, you have to be very careful about how you take feedback and, and sort of what it means and not to cherry pick and all, it, it's a whole art to it. And I just finished my master's degree in, in it actually. <laughs> um, but anyway, so uh, I think it's very important to, to know what your message is, what your vision is, and then to, to, to have a series of, of, of processes where you can put it out in front of people and get feedback and iterate. And so one quick example of that was on Bioshock 1. We went to our first focus group, and you know, Ken has talked about this publicly quite a few times, but you know, we, we, we took it to a group, you know, we're behind the, the, the one-way mirror, that whole thing, right? And so there's... That's really, you really do that? Oh, absolutely, yeah, That's absolutely. Cool. <laughs> and so um, we were all excited. Like, we had been, you know, crunching really hard on this, and it's our first time, really, that the, the you know, people are hands-on with the thing, because up until that point, it had all been videos at E3 and all that sort of thing. And so they're playing it, and we think it looks like they're having a fine time or whatever. When we get to the, the Q&A session, and they uh, they just just tore it to shreds. <laughs> they were calling it a cheap man uh, cheap uh, cheap man's half life and giving it like two out of ten and like just tore it to pieces. And we were all like c completely uh, you know sideswiped, had no idea. We, we we thought the game was you know near perfect, right? And uh, we all left that night. It was a Friday night, right? All went home heartbroken. But before we did, Ken was like, "Listen, I know that that was tough." I want you to all go home, just get a good night's sleep. We're going to come in tomorrow, um, Saturday. Uh, we were, like I said, we're in the middle of crunch. <laughs> but he's like, we, we were already on that schedule or whatever. So we're going to come in tomorrow, uh, and we're going to, we're going to talk this through, right? And the next day, everyone pretty much came in and said, like, you know, they were, they were energized. They weren't, you know, disheartened. I mean, they were to a degree, but they, they, we all knew what we had to do. And we started to break it all down. They say, you know, the game sucks because, you know, like, I, I don't know what the hell's going on or whatever. So we started to break that down. I'm like, okay, well, they're, that we noticed that the, in the videos that they're not, they're getting lost a lot. And we didn't have the right kind of lighting cues to, to guide people down the path. And they weren't, we didn't frame the story enough. And actually, at one point, we, that, at that point, we actually added the, the plane ride at the very beginning of the game, if you remember in Bioshock, right? But up until that point, you started off in the middle of the ocean 
and you see the, the tail of the plane, and that was that, right? So we added this goofy little scene that was like a, a, mm. a, a, like a 30 second little cutscene of you uh, holding your wallet and, and with his face. Yeah, the, 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 the face of uh, he's uh, actually the face of Jack and Bioshock. Right. So uh, fun tidbit. So yeah, you, you can see where we uh, we created that scene out of desperation. Um, <laughs> Take a picture of Bill, just slap it. In. So, <laughs> so uh, but the, the bottom line is is this stuff is 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 invigorating, and I think that there are, you're starting to see more and more of a process uh, in in games. Uh, you know, especially in the bigger companies. I think a lot of companies, especially particularly on the, on the smaller side, tend to be a little bit more precious about things and not necessarily as open. But this is why it's important to, when you go to PAX. Give open and honest feedback, constructive feedback. Don't say your game sucks and you know, like you can go to hell or whatever. You're like try and be constructive and say, hey, what have you considered this? Be open. People want that feedback. So um, yeah, I, I think it's a good time to, to get out there and, and help make games better. So at Naughty Dog, actually, uh, the makers of Uncharted and The Last of Us, they have uh, a feedback room. And not only do they have the one-way glass mirror, the kind of typical cliche thing that you see um, where, where the people stand and watch you through the mirror, is uh, they also have this setup where uh, they have different, it's like a row of booths, and each one has a, a game console and a monitor and headphones. And there are cameras set up so they can watch everybody's faces. And they have it set up so they can watch streams of the playtesters playing and then pause it at different times and take notes. Like, hey, his face looked really bored there, so I'm going to jot this down. Or like, he looked really excited after that moment, so we're going to write that down. And so they have just like taken the, the art of playtesting and feedback and just blew it up. It's like minority report for <laughs> testing. Exactly, exactly. Can you know you, everything that's going to happen. Off the top of your head, can you think of games that maybe ever buckled to too much pressure? Uh, uh, buckled to too much feedback? Taking too much feedback and kind of uh, collapsing under that, under expectations or... You know, the whole design by committee thing is something that, that, that it's sort of a cautionary tale. Um, but off the top of my head, I can't think of any games that, that actually are, are examples. Um, if you give me a second, I might be able to. But it, it is the kind of thing that people talk about, like, hey, whoa, we're, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna, we have a vision. We have to stick to it. And we don't want to design by committee, that whole thing. Um, I'll have to think about that for a second. Is there such a thing, though, as towing the line between uh, fan expectations and, and shareholder expectations? Is that a real thing? Do you see that? Well, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's difficult for me to say. I mean, I know from anecdotes from other people in the industry, but uh, working on the Bioshock series, Take Two and 2K, they were super supportive and super like, this is, you know, they understood the, the art of, of, of game development. And they, they, they gave you, they were, they were involved in the process, but they also completely respected your opinion. And it wasn't the kind of thing where they would go off and do all kinds of focus tests on their own. You were involved in every aspect of the, pr of the process. There was no sort of shadow committee that I hear about with other uh, companies. Like I've, one, one example I, I, I would give was I had a friend who worked on uh, a big AAA shooter. I won't say which game or which, which publisher. Can we guess? And uh, then you, you're welcome to, and I may, may kind of give Rhymes Call it something. <laughs> Battlefield. <laughs> Keep guessing. Um, so uh, he's talking about this one sequence where um, he, he Halo. <laughs> it's the beginning of the game, and it was the first time they're showing it off to the executives. We're talking like, like high level, like publisher executives, right? And they sit him down into this little theater, and it's just the leads and just the executives, and they, they sit down to, to play this video, and and and, and uh, you know, like the lights go down. Screen comes up and you hear gunfire and you're on an airplane and all this stuff and and literally the lead designer who I worked with uh, said he was sitting behind one of the executives and it was not ten seconds in and the executive goes you know what should happen right here and he just starts oh. talking over the video the entire yeah. time like literally ten seconds in hadn't even seen the video and was like no 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 this, this is what and he didn't pay attention oh. to any of it it was like and so he was like yeah I, I was there for another six months and I was like I'm done that's rough <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jason, specifically for you, as the dude with the scoops, the guy, you know, breaking all the hot stuff, how, how did you go about, you know, getting stories from people? How, how do game developers feel about stories when you reach out for your book? Uh, how did people not scurry and run away? How do you, how do you keep that? Like, how are you cool? With well, so so I think you should you should give a little more context here. <laughs> so uh, I assume you're referring to us reporting on games yes. before they're announced, yeah. or reporting on 
things you, that game companies don't want people to. You invented Fallout 4. You've, want devel- you've delayed to. so many games. So I think that's an interesting interesting topic because at Kotaku, we do a lot of reporting on things that game companies don't necessarily want people to know. Um, t- like we did a big story on Mass Effect earlier this year that was based on the accounts of people who were not authorized to talk and had to speak anonymously and go around EA. And yeah, and, and we get pressured all the time by big publishers who come to us for one reason or another. There's one big publisher that uh, is run by babies and has not <laughs> talked to us in four years, uh, the publisher behind Fallout 4. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting, uh, uh, it's interesting to navigate like the the world of quote unquote access, where I would like people to talk to me. I would like publishers like Sony to let me come to Naughty Dog and interview them for a book like this. But I also know that if I have to report on something that they don't want me to report on, I'm still going to do that. Um, fortunately, I wasn't in any situations with this book where I had to like burn a bridge and remove a chapter because suddenly they weren't letting me talk, come talk to them. Um, in my experience, what we're talking about is PR people mostly who get mad about this sort of thing. Um, in my experience, a lot of game developers are, are not really, like they want people to know more things. They, uh, a lot of people are sick of this culture of secrecy that is kind of shrouding the video game industry where everyone insists that a, a game cannot be discussed until this, until E3 and then we have the teaser trailer and then the Game Informer cover and we can't talk about anything. And because uh, uh, if the, one of the funny things about working in the world of video games is you'll be sitting in a room with a game developer at E3 or something like that and you'll ask them the most benign question and the PR person will <laughs> stick in and be like oh we're not talking about that yet we're not talking about how many weapons are in our game just yet because um, they have these strict PR beats that they have to hit yep. and um, I think a lot of in my experience a lot of people who make games don't necessarily love that aspect of it um, but actually I mean when I was reporting on this book I didn't get much resistance um, to nobody was like, oh my God, you reported on this this leak, so you you reported on the new Assassin's Creed before Ubisoft was ready to reveal it, so we're not going to talk to you. Um, I don't think that that people really thought like that, at least in my experience. I mean, who knows? But if you have ran into burned bridges, how do you kind of circumvent that? Well, with, not? with Bethesda, we just don't talk to them. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't go to Bethesda for a chapter in the book because their PR person like can't hates my guts. So, but but that's part of the job, right? I, I always say to people that like you can't be a journalist without pissing people off because if you're not pissing people off in some way, at some point or another, I mean, it's in in video games there aren't a ton of opportunities where you'll be reporting on things that someone doesn't like just because it's an entertainment field and we're all here to appreciate games and I love games and that's that's why I do this job. But there will be times when a company is doing shady things and we have to talk about that. Or like we dig into a story and and actually, so in this book, I have a chapter on Destiny. I mentioned before that's basically how the book started. And the folks behind Destiny, they talk to me, but I think the relationship between me and their PR people is uh, frosty, let's say, mm-hmm. because over the years, I've reported on a lot of things that they didn't want people to know, like behind the scenes stuff and stuff that they're doing and stuff that is in the public interest but not is doesn't curtail to their PR plan. Um, so they declined to comment on this book. And if you read that chapter, you'll see that it's talking to A, people who spoke on background and didn't give their names for the story, and B, people who used to work for Bungie, the, the creators of Destiny, and don't work there anymore. No, no current Bungie employees were allowed to be interviewed for this chapter of the book. So it's that's the type of situation where I mean I'm still gonna do my job whether or not a company will allow me to you know what I mean uh, you, you guys both I think were the first people to mention secrecy in the industry uh, theoretically say you're working on a game you're working really hard on a game and something leaks before you're ready to show it off uh, is that a bummer to you guys or how, how do you react to something oh, of like course that? like yeah. I, I think that there's um, and obviously, I totally respect that. I totally like. I think it, in some ways, it in a lot of ways, it makes uh, development better. I think it makes it worse because developers are super precious about like their their schedules, about how things are going to come out, and all that sort of thing. And there's a lot of time and money that goes into that. Um, 
and I, I don't, you know, thinking about it, I'm not 100% certain why it has to be that way because I look at film and it's certainly not that way. I mean, you look at, we talk about, oh, we signed this movie and it's going to come out at this point yeah. down the road and it's like we know that in advance. Games are obviously very different because, you know, a lot of ways games are reviewed almost as a sort of like a, in some cases, reviewed like a, like a consumer reports yeah. um, article kind of thing where it's like here are the bullet point features and here's what you're getting and it's like it's as a product as well as an entertainment. So you see reviewers take different stances. Sometimes it's just about how it makes me feel and sometimes it's about like here's the frame rate and here's the number of levels and here's all the num number of weapons and all that sort of stuff because some gamers like that. That's, you know, so I think it's good that we have that but I think that when that information comes out in the form of a leak or a sort of uh, catches the, the developer off guard, then that kind of screws up those plans in terms of, because there's power in that, in and it really comes down to trying to obviously get your, put your best foot forward, but also that those sort of features um, become features. You know, you talk about whether it's a new weapon or something like that, that weapon is a, a very powerful tool in getting stories, right? So if we wanted to say like, hey, we have this brand new feature that we're showing off, do you want to do a piece on this? And you go to a to a to a, someone in the press, and then they, you know that's you get additional coverage and get raise additional awareness. That's obviously changed quite a bit now with social media and all that. I don't know that the industry has really changed with that. I think that we're we're still beholden to our old ways in a lot of ways. So. Um, you know, my, my immediate re reaction was like, when we start talking about these kind of leaks, I'm like, oh, you know, because you're so paranoid, you spend so much time. Like when we announced Bioshock Infinite, we had this whole grand presentation. We rented out this hotel and we had all of these like, like it was all 1920s themed uh, or turn of the century, I should say. Um, and so, you know, to have that blown, you spend all this time and money where it's like, boom, here's Bioshock Infinite. That would be heartbreaking. Um, so it's tricky. Uh, I do think that it's worth the industry, well, I don't think we've had the discussion of like, hey, why do we do it this way? So, so there are a few different types of leaks, and I think it's important to draw a distinction between them. Um, with something like, you, you mentioned the Bioshock Infinite info blowout. A good parallel to that is Fallout 4, because Fallout 4 was kept secret for a long time, even though everyone knew Bethesda was working on another Fallout game. It was the most obvious thing in the world, after they finished Skyrim, that they would be doing another Fallout game. Um, it was kept secret, and then we wound up, Kotaku, we wound up reporting the, that Fallout 4 was coming, it is real, and it is set in Boston. Um, that was in the fall of 2013. Then, in the, at, uh, right around E3 of 2015, two years later, Bethesda announced Fallout 4, and you better believe that it was trending on Twitter and got the mega blowout on YouTube and all the other things you would expect. It was the same exact effect as if we had not posted anything at all. So I think that there is this belief in the video game industry that you can't still have the same effect unless like everyone pretends to keep your secret, like, oh, no, they're not making another Fallout game until it's official. And I think that is uh, something that becomes asinine after point like if I were to report on Kotaku that 2k is working on another Bioshock game and it's in development that would not like hurt the inevitable announcement of that Bioshock game it would be one thing if I posted like story spoilers or like uh, a, a, a crappy YouTube video where it's like a, a bad angle of some trailer and it looks terrible I think that that is the type of thing that I think might just be like a, a, a crappy move of us to do um, but I think that that that's why it's different levels and they're always these are conversations that we have internally at Kotaku all the time is like when to cover something when not to cover something when to keep something to ourselves because to report on it would just be spoiling the surprise of something that could be a cool surprise. And there's a lot of nuance here uh, that, uh, that I think uh, is, is worth bringing up. No, absolutely. I, I, just to be clear, I hope you didn't think that I was saying that like, oh, you, you spoiled for, Fallout 4. I did. I thought you were just attacking. <laughs> no, because it's funny because Fallout 4, that, in the industry, that was just like, Every person you could talk to was talking. Oh, it's going to be in Boston, and you know, obviously, we're uh, Irrational Games was in Boston. You know, the studio was there, and so everyone knew it because you you'd be interviewing new people, hiring new people. You go to a convention. And everyone, it was just like the worst kept secret. Um, but that that said, like, no, I think that first of all, everything is is fair game in terms of like. It's funny because. You know, irrational. We used to have like uh, you know big old windows in the back of the, the 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 studio, and it was like overlooking our garage. And really, like at one point, I was walking into the studio, and I'm like looking at people's screens. I'm like, guys, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> pull down the shades. I can see everything you're working on from the parking lot. <laughs> anyway, so um, yeah, I, I think that uh, this is probably something that's worth 
asking uh, the industry as an open discussion is like, hey, why, why are we doing it this way? Um, because I, I agree that, like, again, film, that's not how it's done. Mm -hmm. no, we know every Avengers movie coming out for the next, like, 30 right. years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The same thing. I hadn't really clicked until now. But yeah. uh, changing gears, though, uh, leaving Irrational, and uh, the two of you, I'm fascinated at how you just decided to join forces and do your own thing. How, where do you start with that? How do you, how do you approach that? Amanda, I, in backstage we were talking about it a little. How do you go for that with so many other things going on? It, it, was, it was crazy. Um, so, you know, I was at home with my two children at the time and um, Bill had this really great idea. Um, I can let him tell that part. And I am a writer. And so he was like, well, you're going to write this. And I was like, but I write books, not video games. What do you mean? And so we, but the, the story was so strong and it just kept coming and we had to do it. You know, it was like, a, this is going to happen. We're going to make it happen. This is what we're doing. We're doing it. So um, we sort of did what we had to do. I mean, this became our, both of our jobs. I was working several other jobs, um, taking care of the kids. We had two development babies, <laughs> 13 months <laughs> apart. Um, but it just had to be told and it just had to be made and we're both very passionate creative people and we, I mean, I, I bet if we had like a powwow with our families and friends being like, we think we're gonna do this, everybody would be like, are you crazy? <laughs> what are you talking about? But we just, we just had to, you know? We just had to do it. You should both be really proud. That's really cool. Thanks. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> That's not an easy feat. I, I think that, um, no, I mean, that, that, that's exactly it, I, you know, having, Worked in AAA for, for about 12 years um, and working with, building up amazing relationships in the industry but also at Irrational and having this moment, I don't think I ever would have left Irrational, it was a great company and so in some ways, in a lot of ways it was, it was good whatever happened there, you know, I'm still really close friends with Ken but um, I, I think the, it wouldn't have, you know, when I, when I took a step back and was putting together what I wanted to, to do next, I looked very carefully at what development meant or what, what crunch meant and the time spent on things like commuting, right? Driving an hour, hour and a half to work every day one way and just like, think about all the wasted things. So you really take a look at your life in general and say, what can I do differently? And how can I do it, do it differently? And part of the inspiration to start a new company was not only to work with family and people that I've worked with for years and, and to be able to sort of set my own path, but it was also like on Bioshock Infinite, which I'm extremely proud of. But at one point, uh, towards you know maybe the last year or so, I'm in, I'm in this meeting, and I'm looking around. There's 20, 25 people, and we're all gathered in the, the the room, and we're all talking about Elizabeth's skirt, and the way it moves. And I'm looking around. I'm going like, what the hell are we doing? This is <laughs> this is just wasteful. Like you know, <laughs> like obviously, you know, Elizabeth was the heart and soul of the game, and so to get that right was critical. But I was just like, I I just want to focus on an experience. I want to focus on. Uh, a tight, uh, emotionally resonant experience uh, and, and being able to, to hit, you know, basically for everything about the experience that we created was about sort of trying to craft, uh, you know, a game and a life around an experience, right? Um, and, and so again, it was about focus. It was about um, something that's tight-knit family, really, is what it came down to. Every, every person I worked with on Perception was family, you know? Oh yeah, so we're, yeah, we're in, the other thing too is we're talking about what we wanted to do, and uh, any Foo Fighter fans in the, in the audience? Anyone? <laughs> um, so they have this documentary called Back and Forth, and so it's where they're, uh, it, it's a documentary about how they recorded Wasting Light, which is a great album, but it was, it's incredibly raw, and it's because they recorded it in their garage. This was about, I don't know, six, seven years ago maybe. I listened to it a lot when I was working on Bioshock Infinite, but anyway, so they, they you know, basically got the old band together and they recorded the whole thing in their garage and there's this one scene that really resonated, resonated with me where Dave was recording this one scene and they re you have to record every single instrument separately, right? It's all reel to reel. Um, and so he's recording this one guitar piece and he kind of, you can see his daughter come up right behind him and he's playing this piece and he kind of senses she's there and he's playing and he starts kind of laughing and she kind of leans in closer and he starts cracking up and she as he's playing recording in this amazing album she goes daddy you said we'd go swimming it too <laughs> and so they just cut to the back backyard pool party and they're all like they got the whole band in the pool and they're cooking hot dogs and all. i was like i want that you know i, I want to be able to, to to be there for my family and work with 
get closer with the people I love, the people that I love to work with, you know, the people I work with at Irrational, and my family. That's excellent. Uh, Jason, would you write another book? Would you do it again? Do we want another book? I mean, I... I, I'm, well, I'm they, hungry. I want more. I so. think these guys just bought the first one, so they they don't know. It's yet. good. Spoilers. They might not. Sorry. You guys might not want another one. <laughs> um, yeah. That's a good answer. That's fine. Uh, we do have a couple minutes for like a handful of questions. If anybody has any questions for our guys up here, uh, we do have a microphone. Uh, I saw the first hand go up right here. Hey guys, uh, thanks hey. so much for coming out and talking to us like this. It's, I think, really important that we have these discussions. Um, so I'm a senior studying at NYU. I'm studying narrative design for video games, basically. And I spent like a couple of years with my head buried in game studies, which was a field that I didn't even realize existed until I got to school. And it's amazing. And I think it's something that not a lot of people really realize exists. Um, but then I kind of like put my head up out of the water and realized that like not many of my peers were also like engaged like so critically with those texts and had instead been like just getting better at making games themselves. And so my question is like how valuable is game studies in terms of like actually making games? Like uh, the gardeners, like do you guys think about games in, in that way that deeply? Is that even like something to spend time on for so long? I mean when like Ian Bogos gets on the Atlantic and says like you know, games don't are better without stories. Like, how does that, how do you guys react to something like that? So our game is narrative and story was everything. So um, the texts I sort of studied were um, story by Robert McKee, which is really just such a Bible for writing screenplays, and um, Save the Cat by Blake Snyder. Those are Classic. two really, really awesome books on just the structure of story and story itself. And we really sort of dove into what narratives really lit us up and that got us excited. And we looked in many, you know, we, we watched a lot of films, we played a lot of games, we read a lot of books. So I feel like a, a good story is a good story is a good story is a good story. Um, and they're told in many ways. And that, that's sort of it for me. Like, I, I don't necessarily think that I limit myself to studying good stories in games. I study good stories. If anyone tries to tell you how it's done, you guys, earmuffs, block your ears for a second. <laughs> no, no, they're full of shit. <laughs> because nobody knows. Re read the chapter on Stardew Valley, Valley, and 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 see that like, the, uh, you know, what was it his name? Baro, Barone, 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 yeah. Uh, you know, if he had approached me before making Stardew and and said like, hey, I'm thinking about doing this thing, and I'm going to take five years, or I'm going to do this whole thing in a year, I'm going to write my own engine, and I'm going to write all the all the systems and do it all from scratch, and I'm going to hand draw into the music everything. and all like. I would have looked at him and been like, dude, get, get, get out of here. You're out of your mind. Like, and that, that's me. I'm usually the one telling people, yeah, go for it. You know, uh, it's crazy stuff. But um, you got to find your own path. There are no more gatekeepers. So if, if your narrative is your passion, if, if, if thinking about games analytically, you got to find the way to apply that. Uh, maybe that's reviewing games. Maybe that's, um, you know, doing something. Um, was it the beginner's guide? Is that, is that what, um, just yeah, you yeah, think yeah. about, yeah, 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 you think about uh, the beginner's guide. Have you ever, you ever played it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, but I mean, you think about that, that is a game, that's an experience, but in a lot of ways that is analyzing games and that, that I think there are no rules. Do your own thing. Find your path. Mm -hmm. If you want to chat, let me know. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Thanks for your question. Any other questions? Hi. Um, I know you guys talked earlier about uh, some gamers, how they're very toxic when it comes to not understanding how development works and how difficult it is. But there's also a very vocal and probably sizable segment of those people who will harass a developer based on lines of race and gender and sexuality. So I was wondering if you guys can speak about how do you think that has a significant effect on developers and their willingness to speak out? And what can the industry do about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, having <laughs> been at Kotaku in the middle of Gamergate and being the brunt, like facing the brunt of that, I am very well aware of that particular lovely slice of our gaming community. Um, 
Yeah, I definitely think it has. Um, at some companies, I think you've seen more people being willing to speak out. I think a company like Naughty Dog has been very vocal about their uh, developers' willingness to push for progressive issues and, and have more inclusivity in their games and have stories that aren't just about white dudes. Um, and I think we've seen that from some from other companies as well. I, I, Blizzard has done some really good things in that field. Um, Destiny is a game that is like full of interesting people who are all sorts of races and sexual orientations and um, yeah and I think that that things are definitely getting better things are better now than they were three years ago I think it's still we're still seeing that sort of culture war that is permeated all of the country now at this point. In many ways, the gaming part of that was the vanguard for the the current political situation in this country, which is fascinating and scary. Um, but, but yeah, I, I mean, I think that we could definitely use more people speaking up about it. I think things have gotten better. I think, think things have moved more slowly than they should. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I'm more optimistic than I am pessimistic that that companies are, are more willing to hear other perspectives and get other perspectives in there and be more inclusive and progressive. Thank you for your question. I think we got time for one more. Anybody? Right there in the back. Hey, a um, little bit of a softball question. Uh, Jason, the list of games that you covered is incredible. Um, are there any games as a journalist you wanted to cover more of and either couldn't get to or weren't allowed to? And to you guys, are there games that you are really fascinated by and want to know the stories about uh, of their development and the history of? Yes, I have a few answers to that. So, the yeah, I'm really happy with the list of games and the variety of games, and I wanted to have, like, AAA games, indie games, uh, 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 American games, European games. I, I feel like it's gotten a good mix. Cancel game. Um, I really wanted a chapter on Madden because they crank out a new game every single year on this, like, intense schedule where they cannot miss a single deadline, um, but they weren't interested, probably because they were busy trying to release a game every year. Um, <laughs> And uh, I would have loved to do some Japanese games, but the cultural and language barriers prove very difficult because uh, A, I would need a translator, and B, uh, Japanese developers and Japanese folks in general, like Japanese culture is a lot more about, um, um, I guess, being secretive, being more like respecting the line and not being as candid as you would be in an American studio where I can speak to people privately without a PR person in the room or message them on my own. And uh, the, the challenges there were too difficult to overcome, at least for this book. Um, I would love to, I would still love to tell the story of like Final Fantasy XV or like The Last Guardian and all those other Japanese games that have gone through development hell. Um, maybe one day. Do Metal Gear, please. I need to know. Yeah, Metal what Gear. Happened. That's <laughs> such a fascinating story. Yeah. I guess we'll save it for the sequel. Thank yeah. you guys for coming. Read it. Enjoy it. It's like the best. Thank you.